Um, thanks, Ben. And um, I, I'd like to begin because we are in the month of Elul, which is kind of the um, time when we do our, our more spiritual intensive training according to tradition in preparation for Rosh Hashanah. Um, one of the practices is to blow shofar. Um, you will find that a lot of rabbis who are filled with wisdom and wind are also shofar blowers. I can't vouch for the wisdom, but I can at least um, guarantee you the, the wind part. So I will blow the shofar and um, you know, you can close your eyes a little bit and just think of this as a wordless prayer. Um, one of the ways I like to think of the, the call of the shofar is uh, I grew up in, in Philly and we went to Atlantic City during the summertime. You know, it was just too, too hot and humid. And sometimes, um, you know, the, the undertow was very strong. And as, as kids, especially teenagers, you know, we thought we were stronger and smarter than the undertow. Um, and that's when the lifeguards would blow their whistles very loudly to call us back because we had started to drift a little too far. I think of the call of the shofar as that kind of warning or pay attention. Where are you in your life? Where are your goals and aspirations? And where are you in your reality? That shofar is that call that beckons us back. You know, I'm going to have to take off my headset because I can't hear how I'm blowing. So may the sound of the shofar help bring us back to the people, more of the people who um, we aspire to be. And next time, may I remember to warn my wife who is in the next room with a client that I will be blowing shofar. Okay, so um, I am excited to teach this morning because I learned something new. This is why I love to teach. Um, in the preparation and in the give and take, um, no matter how many times I've looked at a Parsha uh, or a Jewish text, when we engage with each other, we learn something new. And I, I have to tell you why I'm so excited. Um, ben, can, can we get the first text or the text up on the screen? Okay, and as Ben is getting the text up on the screen, or if you have it before you, the Parsha this week is Parshat Shoftim, which means judges. It's all about judges and justice and judgment. Um, this Parsha is one that, that really um, speaks to me, A, because I have a lot of lawyers in my family, but B, um, living in Minneapolis and watching what injustice looks like with the murder of George Floyd, and then watching what justice looks like with the uh, uh, con conviction of Derek Chauvin. Um, and I will uh, proudly tell you that my wife, who is a corporate attorney, um, one of her partners um, volunteered his time pro bono. He was the lead prosecutor um, whose arguments led to the conviction of Derek uh, Chauvin, that was Steve um, Schlisser, for those who remember him. So then watching injustice, um, I, you know, I can't say it completely turned into justice because, you know, he'll never come back, he'll never be part of a family, but at least watching justice at work was very, very significant. Um, there's another reason that this topic of, of justice and law and judgment uh, mean a lot to me. You know, sometimes there are stereotypes of Judaism as a religion 
of law, right? Of vengeance, of judgment. And nothing could be further from the truth. Um, for example, and you can put your answers in the chat box. When you hear the word Pharisee, think of how it may be used in passing on uh, TV and the movies. Um, you know, what, what, what do you, what comes to mind? And please put your answers in the chat box, Pharisee. Law and judgment, yep. Oh, good, good, hypocrite. Oh yeah, it isn't, well, okay, it isn't necessarily negative. Um, it doesn't have to be, but I would say colloquially, at least as I've heard it, um, I've only heard it used in a, if not an overt, at least an indirect way of um, implying some sort of um, harshness. Uh, legalistic, this is great, okay. So when I hear the word Pharisee, I used in this context, right? Not in a college classroom where people are, you know, trying to understand who were these people. I get offended because the Pharisees were in all likelihood the proto-rabbis, right? They were the ones, um, I, I kind of feel like I'm related to them. You know, like if there wouldn't be Pharisees, I couldn't have become a rabbi. So Pharisee, law, stern, judgment, it couldn't be further from the truth. And here's what I discovered for the first time. Um, if you take a look, please, at the first text, what does Genesis have to do with our Parsha? What does Abraham, Abraham have to do with our Parsha? The choice of Abraham's election by God is shrouded in mystery. We know so little about why of all people was Avraham chosen. Now, part of the reason was Sarah, was his wife Sarah, because God said, you better listen to her. She's a greater prophet than you are. But why start with Avraham? Well, here I think is, uh, are two passages where we have a hint and they relate directly to this week's Parsha Shoftim. The context in the first source, Genesis 18, followed almost a few verses afterwards, is God is ready to destroy um, Stom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah. And for some reason, I, I, I can guess, God is ambivalent about whether or not to reveal this information to Avraham. After all, the relationship between God and Avraham is new. And not only that, how is it that Avraham will possibly think that he and his wife will be the progenitors of a nation if this God is about to destroy two highly populated cities? And God leaves it as kind of an open question, but look at what God says in verse 19. For I have singled Abraham out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the way of the Lord by doing, and here are the words, staka, and staka doesn't mean um, only, right, giving um, giving money, financial support to people. Staka, the word tzedek, means what is just and what is right. Um, and actually, mishpat means that uh, Abraham will deliver righteous justice. Not just righteousness and not just justice. But these two words are connected literally with a, a Hebrew letter Vav, which is a connecting word. Avraham will do staka umishpat. Then we get to the next source. And here, God, uh, Avraham is confronting God. 
I, I love this because for me, this is what it means to be, to be a Jew. It's to have enough chutzpah and enough faith in God not to be afraid to challenge God. So if we're angry, if we're upset, if we see injustice, um, you know, challenge. That, that's, that's very part of the Jewish tradition. And what does Abraham say? Far be it from you to do such a thing, God, right? Because how do I know? Abraham is, you know, like testing God. Maybe in these two highly populated cities, maybe there's one person who doesn't deserve to die. I mean, is it really possible that every inhabitant is worthy of a death sentence? I mean, that, that just horrifies Abraham. It offends him. And what does he say? Um, lach, which we translate as usually God forbid, but it means far be it from you. Hashofet kol ha'aretz lo yase mishpat. Shall not the judge of the, uni- of the earth deal justly? And in a verse earlier, Far be it from you to destroy Sadiq, one who is righteous with one who is wicked. So in these two sentences, we see the juxtaposition of Tzadka, of Sadiq in verse 25, which here is translated as innocent. Um, and it really can also mean someone who, you know, is, if not righteous, at least not guilty, right? Someone who does. Um, is not worthy of death. And we have these two words again, um, tzedek and mishpat in 25 and 20, in verse 25, actually. So why did I get excited? Um, I, I am excited because I never saw the thread, the line that went from our very origins as Jews, right? Um, with Avraham as someone who is concerned about staka and mishpat going hand in hand, that it has to be righteous justice. I never saw the line going from there to our Parsha before. Um, now, if we can take a look, at, let me stop there. And if you have any questions or comments, um, please put them in the chat box and I'll, I'll read through them for a moment. No? Okay. I, I always get a little concerned because I'm not, I, I know I'm not usually that, that clear. Oh, okay. No longer doing conversation with God. Mm-hmm. So, um, Ariel is raising, I think, a very serious comment, question about, so today, if we heard somebody saying that God told me to act this way, what, like, how do you respond when you hear people say something like that? I'm just, just curious. I'm doing this because I heard the voice of God or I prayed, I listened to God, and here's what God is telling me to do. Love to see your, your reactions to that for a moment. <laughs> okay, so um, you know your reactions. You know what's wrong with this person? Are they schizophrenic? Phrenic? Um, you know, assume they were Christian. So, what I would challenge us to think about, and uh, there is no uh, Hebrew connection between um, shofar and 
uh, mishpat, the root for those who know Hebrew of shofar is um, shin pei resh, and the root of uh, mishpat is shin pei tet. But that's a good question. Nice, nice alliteration, uh, alliterational here. Um, so, why is it that our our Jewish ancestors somehow could hear the voice of God? And because we are so far removed, we have so many layers of history, of text and tradition, that at least sometimes we can't hear the voice of God. I just raised that as a, as a question. And when I say the voice of God, it may not be a literal voice. It might be that moment when we experience something that we, is kind of ineffable. You know, we, we just have this moment when we feel like there's something large out there. And despite that, we still have some connection to it. Um, I, uh, ben, will you say the comments in the chat? I want to have a chance to read, read them afterwards because they're, I, I love the, the, uh, the, the look at the Dylan quote. And then, of course, um, I think Woody Allen, very ambivalent individual, in my opinion, also has a piece on, um, on the Akedah. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. But yeah, like we, Abraham hears the voice of God, like, why does he act one way in one case and one way in a different case? He argue for strangers in a town, but won't argue for his own son. I mean, it's very complicated. But all that I'd like to say is um, to ask. And this is hard for me. So I'm not, you know, whenever I ask a question, it's not just of you. It's of me, especially after this year. Can we still try to peel back the hurt, the doubt? the questions and periodically just feel something greater than ourselves that connects us back to our ancestors who somehow managed to think about staka umishpat, righteous justice and justice for all because that will lead us into our Parsha. So we'll go quickly to the next text, Ben. That's number three. So, um, look at the qualities of judges. Who serves as a judge? And by the way, Shoftim um, show dream. it says appoint magistrates, ma magistrates and officials. What that probably means is um, both judges and those who can enforce the law. In fact, the modern Hebrew word for a uh, a for the police in in Hebrew is shoter. It's what appears here, as a matter of fact. So, one thing that is quite brilliant about this passage is that the judges have to be above suspicion. But the end of that first verse in 18, here's what got me excited. Appoint magistrates and officials, you know, and all the settlements that the Lord your God is giving you, and they shall govern the people. Do justice is not a good translation. Here we have the words again, mishpat sedek. It isn't enough just to administer justice. It has to be righteous justice. justice. It's got to be justice in context, always accessible equally for everyone. But just as Avraham started with Mishpat Sedek, so we see that his progenitors who become the judges have to be characterized as people who embody Mishpat Sedek. They have to administer judgment along with righteousness. They can't be separated. And, um, you know, these judges can't accept 
a bribe. Now let's go to verse 20. Sedek, Sedek, Tir Dov. Very famous phrase. Um, you'll find a lot of um, Jewish lawyers will have artwork that incorporates this phrase, justice, justice shall you pursue. Question for you. Um, please put your answers in the chat box. Why, why doesn't it just say justice shall you pursue or you shall pursue justice? Why do we have the doubling of the word um, tzedek, justice, which actually should be translated as righteousness, by the way, not justice. But why double a word? Why repeat it? Okay, it's emphasis, good. Oh, nice. Justice for our people, not good. Mm -hmm. So another interpretation is justice has to be pursued by just means. Because if you don't pursue justice with just means, then you actually wind up perverting the law. And we've all seen that many times before. But I mean, all of these um, comments are valid. And I think, again, the emphasis is that we have to pursue justice. And I really wish this had been translated as righteousness. Because this emphasis on justice, again, perpetuates a stereotype that Jews only care about justice. That's not what it says. Sedek, righteous justice shall you pursue. Uh, does it mean giving an appropriate sentence, not a slap on the wrist? Well, um, it, it all depends upon the context. If what's appropriate is a slap on the wrist, then that's justice. If what's appropriate is a punishment and somebody gets a slap on the wrist, or if what's appropriate um, is a slap on the wrist and they get a punishment, that would be an injustice. Okay, so again, from Avraham to Shoftim, we have Mishpat Sedek with a greater emphasis on Sedek. Now, um, we'll skip number four, and I'd like to go to number five. So, um, the need to deliver, to set up a court system, and to make sure that we create a just and righteous society is a, a commandment in the Torah. It's also one of the things that um, a town is required to do as it's being established. Unlike number five, um, where we have a, a discussion about a king, a Jewish monarch, the Torah looks negatively upon the appointment of a human king, because after all, what do we need a king of flesh and blood, blood when we have God who is described as a sovereign, as the Melech Malchei Hamlachim, as the ultimate sovereign of sovereigns. So why do we need that? And that's why Judaism looks unfavorably. Also, uh, pardon me, I just have a little dryness in my throat today. Um, and also, we know that once somebody gets into power, the temptation to be corrupted will be too great. Generally, that has been the history of um, people and power. So what does the Torah do to at least mitigate the possibility, or at least the extent to which a king may become corrupt, the sovereign may become corrupt. Um, <clears throat> when the king is seated on his royal throne, he shall have a copy of this teaching, meaning this Torah, et mishneh ha-Torah, and he has to have it on a scroll written by the Levites, by the living. And not only that, it's not that he writes it and then hides it away in a corner. To the contrary, 
let it remain with him and let him read it in all of his life so that the, the human sovereign may learn to revere the heavenly sovereign to observe faithfully every word of this Torah as well as these laws. So the way that the Jewish tradition developed this idea was that each time a new Jewish monarch was appointed, and if you want to read about that in the Tanakh in the Bible, um, you can sort of read the book of, uh, you can look at the, um, the hub on my Jewish learning. I'm sure that there are plenty of classes uh, on the book of Judges, right? The book of Kings, if I think I recall seeing something there. And you can see how, how um, the monarchy was pretty much a failure. I mean, it only lasted as a united monarchy um, for one generation, right? David was first Jewish king. His son Solomon um, was the first one to become a king um, in succession, and his kingdom split apart after he died. So everything that the Torah says here, um, its concern is spot on. The warnings, uh, and I didn't quote the whole thing. It says, uh, quote the whole thing, lawyer velo susim, lawyer velo kesef, right? A king will only want more money to pay troops and to have a royal palace, will want more horses, and horses come from Egypt, but you left Egypt and you're not supposed to go back to Egypt. You're just asking for trouble. To mitigate that, the Torah says, okay. I'm going to make a concession. You want a king? You can have a king. But here's the deal. The king has to write or have the Levi'im write a safer Torah explicitly for him. He can't have a Torah that was passed down from the last king because even if the king can't write the Torah, he has to watch the scribe write the Torah to make that impression that you are not above the law. You know, we always say that, but we see people who are above the law. The Torah is saying, you have a Torah with you. And actually the halakha is Jewish law is two Sifrei Torah, not one. One that remains next to his throne and one that is a traveling Torah. And that is at least to symbolically Remind the king, you are not the law. You have to embody the law that you have received. Hmm? Justice means no one is above the law, not even the king. And while we take that as a given today in Western democracies, understand that in ancient societies, the king was the law because the king was a deity. And so much of Judaism is not inventing something new, but taking something in the milieu and actually recrafting it to express a different set of values. So here the king is not above the law. The king has to embody God's law because how can a society be just if its rulers somehow operate by their own law. And that's what, again, it means to have a just society, yeah? that not just, just judges and righteous enforcers of the law, but those who lead also have to be dedicated to the law so that they can create this aspirational society in which there is justice for all. Now, um, let's see, the way we have the sources laid out, let me just check the chat box to make sure there's nothing uh, I am missing. Yeah, yes, yeah, Saul was the first king. Uh, I, I apologize, that is, uh, thank you for the, the correction. Um, 
you know, it's, it's funny that I slipped in and said David because Saul was a, a, a failed king. Um, now, one might argue that David was a failed king. Uh, he said, go to the hub again. I'm sure somebody gave a course on David. Um, very, very problematic character. Um, we're not going to go into that now. You know, I think if you were to ask me about the question of law evolving, yes. I mean, the reason that Judaism is still here as a, as a living um, religion and that we're a living people is that we don't read the Bible literally, nor do we believe that the Bible is the last word. If we had made that error, we wouldn't be studying Torah today. It's the evolving nature of the law um, that adapts to society that keeps us going. Okay, now I want to go on to the next text, which, um, I mean, it really, really upsets me when people misinterpret it. So the end of this text, it, it, by the way, it deals with, um, again, what we call equal justice. Uh, it's a case of, you know, false testimony, um, and the magistrate shall make it their own investigation. Again, justice means not snap judgment. It means thoroughly investigating. Ben, if you could go to the next page, please. Look at the end of this. Nor must you show pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. That is often interpreted. Well, how do you understand that when you see that phrase? An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. How do you make sense of that? What does it uh, say to you? Okay, proportional justice. I want to get back to that. Okay. Pain for pain. Not literal, but compensation. Revenge. Now, this is often... Well, yeah, <laughs> an eye for an eye, and we're both blind. So, I, I, you know, I'm glad that many of you um, understand that this is proportional justice. <clears throat> Pardon me. In the context of the ancient Near East, this was a radical advance. What it meant was that if I, if I took the life of a slave, then the person who exacts vengeance could kill a family member, or if I, if I harmed, you know, a slave's arm, then the person who exact, exacts vengeance might take the life of my slave. Justice was disproportional. It depended upon your status and your class in society. If you were in an upper class, then you got to exact revenge at a much greater level than someone at a, lower, at a lower status. So that's number one. What this statement meant in the Torah is proportional justice, as Ariel said. You cannot take the um, life of another human being because one of your family members was injured, but is alive. 
and, and the advance, the revolution that that was, was really significant. However, the rabbis, and now we'll take a look at source number seven, and, and there's so many of these sources that, you know, they, they can't imagine that this was ever carried out. And also we have other sources in the Torah that talk about monetary compensation that damages our monetary compensation. So here, uh, and this is a source in the, in the Gemara. So if an eye for an eye is literal, what do I do if somebody's blind? How do I exact punishment on them? Um, you know, or if somebody had severed limbs, like how do I exact punishment on them? That's the rabbi's way of saying, this is ridiculous. Of course it doesn't mean an eye for an eye. That's not who we are. What it means is you have to give monetary compensation. And it's very likely that that's, that's what it meant when you look at all the different sources of the Torah. But what it doesn't mean is that Judaism exacts vengeance, an eye for an eye. What it means is no. Justice is proportional and we we deliver justice through fair monetary compensation. Okay, um, we have just five more minutes and I will end on time. Um, now what we're going to do is I wanna summarize this last source from our Parsha and then I'll, I'll wrap things up. We have a very strange case here uh, it's called the Egla Arufa, um, the case of a calf whose neck is broken. It's really about finding um, a mate, someone who is dead, um, lying in between, laying in between two cities. And what happens? The elders of both cities have to, you know, swear in a ceremony, um, if it's true, that is, that they don't know who this victim is and they had nothing to do with his murder or his death. And yet, they have to perform a ceremony. The elders of the town who are nearest to this corpse have to... Um, recite before God, and this is uh, in, in verse seven, verse seven and eight. And they shall make this declaration, our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it done, right? Yadenu lo shachu et adam azev, einenu lo ra'u. Absolve, O Lord, your people, Israel, whom you have redeemed, and do not let guilt for the blood of the innocent remain among your people, Israel. And this is really an expression of, I would say, a, a kind of collective guilt for the town nearest by. And that's because even if people were not directly involved um, in the death of this individual, somehow, because they were nearby, they're still responsible because the murder or the death of an individual um, is really the gravest injustice. And to live in a just society means that we have to save an individual who has been found dead in the field from oblivion. Justice means that the unnamed, the people who have no voice, have their due, even if it's posthumously. Justice means that we are all responsible for the welfare of everyone in or near our community. And when this gravest of injustice happens, the community as a whole has to enact a ritual 
that acknowledges a certain kind of failure. So justice doesn't only happen in the public city gates. Um, that's how our texts open, right? The judges are in the city gates. Ju justice was public and supposed to be public and transparent, but it also means justice has to happen at the margins of society as well. So um, to wrap up and then we can leave a moment for uh, questions. I said that there are three reasons that I wanted to talk about um, this, this Parsha, this notion of justice and what it means. And the last one was in preparation for Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Hadin, right? One of the names is the Day of Judgment. And I think that there is some value, great value to feeling like once a year, once a year we have to stand before God, before ourselves, right? And again, um, not harshly, because that, that doesn't usually promote change, but honestly, with the intent of really trying to do a little differently this year and to acknowledge um, our failures, okay? A failure, I don't see as, as somehow a, a dirty word, a bad word, right? We succeed, we fail, and it's okay to say we fail because I don't think God expects any of us to be perfect. But if we want to be better, we have to at least acknowledge a shortcoming, a failure, you know, a missed mark, however you want to say it, with kindness to ourselves. And why kindness? And I'll end with this beautiful Midrash. Bisha'asha Yisrael notlin et shofrehem v'tokin l'ifnei Gadosh Baruch Hu v'tokin ha-Kadosh Baruch Hu omed mikisei adin so on this Yom Hadin, on this Day of Judgment, we're taught that when Israel takes their shofarot and sounds them before the Holy One, blessed be God, God stands up from the throne of judgment and sits on the throne of rachamim, of mercy of kindness. So what God wants is not to judge us harshly, but to judge us with kindness. And with that, I'm going to go because that alarm is not my shofar, but it's coming from my kitchen. I wish you a Shabbat Shalom, everyone. <laughs>